genesis of this book was no it was different really I, I, I wrote a biography of uh, an experimental novelist called B.S. Johnson a few years ago and a uh, kind of key period in his life was when he was a student in the late 1950s and I did a lot of research into that particular moment of his life and that got me very interested in that, that moment in the late 50s really before, as Philip Larkin said, sexual intercourse started in 1963 and everything kind of kicked off. Um, you know, the kind, of, the kind of last days of, of buttoned-up Britain, really, I suppose you'd call it. So I was looking, I was looking for a way into that, and uh, couldn't really find... I wanted, I wanted to peg it to something that had happened historically, but I couldn't really find anything until I was, I was in Belgium a few years ago doing an interview for Belgian radio, and they, they asked if they could interview me at the Atomium. So they, they took me there, and uh, I discovered this amazing building, which I knew nothing about and realised that Expo 58 was a massive moment still in Belgian post-war history and in the Belgian collective memory. And I thought, well, the Brits would be here. It's Expo 58. I wonder what we got up to. And so I started looking into that, and then I thought, yeah, this is a great way to write about Britain in, in 1958. Sort of to do what, uh, I don't know, what, what Ian Forster did in some of his novels, I suppose, which is to find out what... British people really like is to send them abroad, put them in, and put them in a foreign context, and and see how they behave. I was surprised reading the recent David Kiniston book and Dominic Sandbrook's books on the fifties that they don't mention Expo Fifty Eight. But that, but that's kind of typical in a way of the fact that the British didn't really throw themselves into it heart and soul. They thought it was they thought it was a bit European and a bit modern, and uh, you know they they kept it at a little bit of a distance. So. I mean, my, my first reaction to the Atomium was a very emotional one, actually. I, I found it a very moving building because it was so kind of aggressively futuristic, but at the same time so dated. And it was just a kind of perfect 1950s vision of what the future might be like. And of course, it's turned out to be nothing like that at all. It's, these visions are always kind of completely off course. Um, so then I started asking Belgian people who remembered the expo, you know, what about the British presence? Because they, they talked about the Soviet pavilion, they talked about the Czech pavilion, which made a big impact. They talked about the Philips building, which was very mod modernistic and futuristic and so on. Nobody could remember the British site at all. So I had to come back here to, to find out about that, and I found out that it was designed by James Gardner, who did a lot of the Festival of Britain buildings, that there was a, a lot of arguments about it because some people wanted it to be very forward-looking, some people wanted it to be full of heraldry and pageantry and the royal family and all that kind of thing. So it, it kind of localised what was for me a very useful debate about what, what Britishness is and how you present it to the rest of the world. Um, you know, very much as, as Danny Boyle's Olympic opening ceremony did, which was happening while I was writing the book. It was a nice kind of moment of, of synergy, really. But I think Danny Boyle got it right and the, the Brits, in retrospect, kind of got it slightly comically wrong with Expo 58. I was delighted to find that there was a pub called the Britannia, which had subsequently fallen into, into kind of decadence and decline. That was a kind of gifted metaphor for, uh, for, for Britain in the last 50 years. The pub itself was very much of its time. Uh, you know, they designed it to look like a yachting club because they thought this was very, you know, light and modern and airy and forward-looking for 1958. Uh, the food, by the sound of it, was probably pretty terrible compared to what the other pavilions were offering. And uh, you know, it just seemed intensely and narrowly British a thing to export to that particular, that particular fair, which, which chimed with everything else I found out about the British contribution, really. They made a promo film, Whitbread made a half-hour film about the Britannia, which I, I wasn't able to trace. Very disappointingly, I, I pursued it through my contacts at the BFI and that kind of thing, but we couldn't, uh, we couldn't come up with it. So I've never seen any moving images of it. It would be nice if, if some turned up. And it's some guy on the internet down in Kent, I think, claims to have the pub sign, the original pub sign from the Britannia. So... Um, I don't know, I might try to buy that off him sometime. Well, you compared the book to, to What a Carve Up earlier, and it occurs to me that there is a point of comparison. I think this is, this is probably the closest thing I've come since What a Carve Up to writing a postmodern novel, in that it's very elusive. Uh, it's full of allusions, both obvious and buried, to British films of the 30s and 40s and 50s. 
uh, the names of Thomas's colleagues at work will only be picked up by 50s British film fans, Trace Purcell, Stanley Windrush. They're all from the Bolting Brothers comedies. They're all Ian Carmichael and Terry Thomas's characters from those films. Um, now, uh, possibly my favorite British film of all time is The Lady Vanishes by, by Alfred Hitchcock. And, uh, you know, really, if, if, if you want to try and define what I was trying to do in this book, I was trying to write a kind of literary version of that, I suppose. Just a light film and a, a, a kind of light comedy thriller, but so perfectly done that it actually, you know, has has, has lasted wonderfully well and is still as, as as fresh as it ever was. And I particularly love uh, the characters of Charters and Caldicott, the two uh, buttoned-up uh, Englishmen who have this wonderful comedy double act in that film and are played who are played by Basil Radford and Norton Wayne. So I stole the names of the actors who played those characters called them Radford and Wayne, and just, uh, just started writing dialogue, really. I wasn't sure how much I was going to use them, but I wrote the scene uh, when Thomas first meets them and they take him to a coffee bar and they grill him on his, you know, whether, whether he's gay, whether he's interested in Russian things and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed writing that and, and the dialogue came very easily, so I just, I just brought them back in as often as, as often as the plot would allow, really. Well, I'm not sure where I'm next going to take the, the recurring characters who appear in this book and, in, and also in The Rain Before It Falls and in some of my short stories. I mean, I'm trying to keep these connections as oblique and as low-key as I can because, uh, you know, publishers hate it when you write sagas and sequels because the successively, unless they really take off, then they never, they never sell as, subsequent volumes never sell as well as the others. And I, you know, I, I, I was quite uh, taken aback myself by this when I wrote The Rogers Club, which so many people read and so many people loved. Uh, and then I thought, well, obviously they'll all go out and buy The Closed Circle because it's the sequel, but, uh, but only, you know, only about half the people who bought The Rogers Club went out and bought The Closed Circle. So I thought, okay, so that doesn't, it doesn't quite work the way that I thought it did. Um, so I want to make these stories as uh, self-contained as possible. Obviously, Expo 58 is, a, is an entire is a novel by itself, and you don't need any foreknowledge of the rain before it falls. But uh, there is a big family tree pinned up in the in the wall in my in my study, and there are various branches of this family which I've used now in novels and short stories. There are various branches of it I haven't really used yet at all, or only mentioned just kind of glancingly. So, um, so I can I can take them anywhere really. I mean, I've I have got a big scheme in my head, a big sort of structure in my head. But the individual novels could could kind of fit anywhere in that in that scheme. So, you know, it's it's wide open at the moment. All these uh, kind of indecisive, slightly rudderless male heroes that I've written about over the years are all are all me really. The only decisive thing I ever do is is when I sit down and write a write a novel and in that particular sphere I can be kind of decisive and, and in control but the rest of the time I'm a very passive sort of person really. So I, I mean I, I'm constantly trying, with every novel I tell myself okay I'm going to create a really dynamic hero this time who's going to drive the action and push people around and this kind of thing and it never never works out that way. I think the closest I got to it really is, is Rosamond in The Rain Before It Falls who, who of course is female. So maybe Maybe that's the answer. Maybe I should write about more women characters, and maybe I can, I can kind of channel my inner dynamism more that way. So the next James Bond book is not for you, then? Well, I think a James Bond book by me would be great, really. It'd be fascinating to have a James Bond book where he's kind of pushed around by everybody else, and he, he doesn't really decide anything, and you know he he dithers and he all that kind of thing. I think that would be, you know. Re regenerate the franchise, really. Uh, I want to carry on writing funny books. I've just written a big piece for The Guardian about sort of in defense of the comic novel, really, which I feel has got a little, got its back up against the wall a little bit in the face of the kind of grimness and darkness of everything that's going on in Britain and the rest of the world at the moment. But uh, that's, just, that's really as far as I can say. I, I, I think I want to write about a book about contemporary Britain next. I think I want it to be funny. That's about all I know.